Man, what a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Boy, as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I'm so thankful you have chosen to worship with us here this morning at Shelby Christian Church. You know, resurrection morning. Today we are filled with a, a renewed hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I say, He is risen. You know how to reply to that? He is risen indeed. One more time, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Because of our Christ's resurrection, uh, we have, each and every one of us, uh, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord, we have a resurrected, uh, restored hope. We have a restored hope. Uh, most of us, if not all of us, we understand the feeling of having no hope because there are times in our lives that we go through, we just feel like there, there just is no hope. Um, and most of us know all too well, unfortunately, that the feeling of having no hope uh, may be one of the most painful things uh, that we go through in life. Sometimes that uh, disappointment comes from things that are, are, are rather insignificant, and while other times it comes from life-altering trials that we face from time to time. You know, lack of hope might come from the different places in life where we find ourselves or uh, perhaps something that we encounter uh, throughout the day, throughout the week, the month, the year. Uh, there are differing degrees of no hope. You know, I begin to lose hope when I find a package of Oreo cookies on the shelf in the pantry with only one cookie left in the packet. I mean, that is no hope. Uh, there are other things uh, that tend to knock the wind out of you, like when uh, Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs this year lost in the 2022 NFL playoffs. Not that they're my team, so it wasn't quite as bad as the no hope I got when the uh, uh, Colts didn't make the, you know, get much further in the playoffs. As a matter of fact, they didn't hardly make it at all, but they did. They were there. You know, but really on a more serious note, uh, the bad uh, economy that we face, the everyday raising prices that each of us uh, pay when we go to the gas pumps, when we go to the market, uh, the uncertainty of war and peace in the world, uh, perhaps with you it's a bad diagnosis from a doctor, uh, perhaps of a, of a friend even, uh, or maybe it's the passing of a loved one that you've experienced in the last few years. It's a loss of hope. And uh, frequently we do face that. Each one of us, um, you know, as these pictures that I've painted, carries with it all kinds of emotions. For the disciples, the followers of Jesus, he, his crucifixion must have been for them, and, and of course Steve spoke to this in his um, communion meditation this morning, uh, but for most of them, uh, this had to be one of the darkest times uh, in, in their walk with Jesus. And of course they walked with him, uh, many of them, for three years. You know, they had, a, they had placed all of their hope in him, but now he's gone. He, he's dead. Uh, and they believe that he truly was a Messiah, uh, that through his life he would change the world. Uh, that's what Jesus taught. Uh, they didn't understand it all, but at the time of Jesus' death, there were those who believed. It was not until a woman named Mary went to visit the tomb that hope was restored. You know, the tomb was empty, and Jesus had risen. All Mary wanted to do was to hold on to her Savior once that she discovered the good news that he did, uh, in fact, raise from the dead, and that he was alive. She just wanted to hold on, and we'll see that in our uh, text this morning. Easter is the reminder that because Jesus is alive, we do have hope, not only in this life, but beyond. We have hope in this life and beyond. And so um, that's what we want to talk about this morning. Have you ever thought about the fact that just before Easter, uh, it was a time of mourning uh, for Jesus' um, uh, death? It was a, not a celebration of life, once again, um, that, that Steve talked about in his meditation. It was not a time of celebration. It was a time of mourning his death uh, just before uh, the resurrection. You know, it would have been only a few days before uh, when the disciples would have watched their friend, uh, the one they believed to be the long-awaited Messiah, be crucified on a Roman cross. They had placed all their hopes and their dreams in, in the coming of the, the kingdom. 
That was Jesus was going to bring into the world a, a new kingdom. But on that Friday, when Jesus was brought down from the cross and laid inside a, a, of a tomb, his followers were crushed. They were crushed. It was the finality of Jesus' death that would have been the, the knockout blow to any hope that the disciples had for a world where uh, God would finally rule and reign. So where he would free his followers from the sin that had uh, corrupted everything, uh, they just kind of lost that hope. It, it wasn't going to happen. And after three days of deep sorrow, uh, they were in need of resurrected hope. My friends, like the followers of Jesus then, if we are honest this morning, uh, some of us come here today in need of a renewed hope. You know, life has not been easy. And, and some of us have faced great challenges over the past uh, few years. Perhaps you've experienced, again, a devastating loss over the last few years. Maybe your closest relationship ha has suffered recently. Some have had to come to terms with a diagnosis that makes their uh, future looks, look uncertain. And all of this with the backdrop of, of the pandemic that still has lasting effects. Those that have lost loved ones, those who are still suffering from physical after effects. Uh, these things are more uh, weighty than sometimes we realize. And it, it makes us question, if God still cares about us, is he still working in the world? Is he still at work? But the Gospels tell us that right in the middle of the disciples' darkest hours came a light of hope. You know, if you've yet to take your outline out of your bulletin at this morning, I'd like to encourage you to do so. It's so much easier to follow along with the sermon as you fill in with the blanks and so on. But if, uh, your prerogative, whatever you choose to do. But I'd like for you to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 20 if you will. And, uh, you know, maybe you've got that on your iPhone, a Bible app, and if you do, that's great. Go there. Uh, but maybe you have it on hard copy, the Bible, the print, God's holy word. Not that it's not God's holy word on your iPhone, because it is as well. Uh, but so however you choose to get there in John chapter 20, you know, hope appears when we least expect it. That's on your outline. Hope, uh, it, it appears when we least expect it. So early in the morning, on the third day after Jesus' death, a woman named Mary Magdalene made her way to the tomb. Uh, other places in the, in the scriptures tell us that she has come to anoint his body for burial. Some of you may remember Mary Magdalene. Mary was a disciple of Jesus. And according to the gospel accounts, Jesus cleansed her of seven demons. And she... Uh, financially aided Jesus throughout his ministry. She must have been a fairly wealthy uh, woman. She was one of the witnesses of the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus. But when she arrives, she finds the tomb empty. That's not what she expected at all. Again, as I say, she was there to anoint his body uh, for burial. And so she finds the tomb empty. And what must have been adding insult to injury, Mary concludes that someone must have come and taken him away. And so she was devastated. So if you're there in, in, in John chapter 20, John chapter 20, I'd like to move down to uh, verse 10, if you would please. John 20, verse 10. <clears throat> I'm reading from the word of our Lord. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Verse 13, they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. You see, as Mary looks at the tomb uh, where Jesus had been laying, uh, all she can see is what is missing. She sees that Jesus is not there, but she f fails to see what is there because she is focused on the fact that Jesus' body is nowhere to be seen that she misses the two angelic beings who are seated where Jesus was. 
And through the tears, she tells the angels that she is heartbroken. Why? Because not only is Jesus dead, but now his body has disappeared. She has no idea where uh, he's gone. And so this is what can happen to us, I believe, when we are losing hope in life. When our dreams are shattered and our future becomes unclear, we fail to see what might be happening, what God might be doing uh, in this situation. We fail to remember that God is, in fact, in control of all things. And after Mary speaks to the angels, she turns to leave and comes face to face with who? The resurrected Lord. She comes face to face to the resurrected Lord. But listen to what verse 14 says. She did not realize that it was Jesus. She did not realize that it was Jesus. Resurrection hope was standing right in front of her, and she was unable to see it because of the fog of despair, I believe, that had come into her life after Jesus passed. So after all, Mary had not come to the tomb uh, expecting Jesus alive. She came expecting to find a, a lifeless body. My friends, we need to live in a constant state of anticipation in this life in which we live. A constant state of anticipation. Anticipation is hope. But it is the kind of hope where we're not, I, I hope this happens or I hope this doesn't happen. No, it's anticipating, knowing because of our walk with the Lord what's going to happen and we're anticipating. We're just simply waiting for that to happen. There is nothing like taking part, uh, just to give you a little example, in a family Easter egg hunt. Anybody participate in a family Easter egg hunt so far yet this weekend? Or is all that coming up this afternoon? No hands? Oh, forget the eggs, Kay. I don't know where we're going. So we did yesterday. And so Kay and I are going to be without eggs today. But, you know, watching my kids and my, my grandkids look for eggs each year is one of my favorite things that happens around this spatial day. And often we have done it on Sunday, but as the kids have grown, you know, things begin to change a little bit, and uh, some of them do their own thing, and so on and so forth. But, and I know each family is different, but our family will hide eggs in the yard and search for them over and over again. I know there have been some years in the past where we've hidden eggs four or five times. It seems like it goes on almost all day long. But there's even one egg each year that is sought after, and that is what? The golden egg. The golden egg, you know, that golden egg is something special. This year there was a surprise golden egg, though, in our family. And the right person had to be kind of directed, you know, to that egg. So they were the one to be sure and get that egg. Because inside that egg was a surprise invitation to a prom. Isn't that sweet? Won't you take me to the prom? And I'll tell you what, I'm not going to go any further than that because... I might get in trouble. They're within listening distance from me at the, <laughs> at the moment. And I won't say that they're probably sitting in the front row over here somewhere. <laughs> I told them I wouldn't say any names. Have I said any names yet? No, I have not. But, you know, really, watching my kids and grandkids look for eggs each year is one of my favorite things uh, on this uh, spatial day. But why do kids want to hunt eggs over and over again? Why do they want to do that? Well, here's why. They love to be surprised by the locations where the eggs are found. The kids often jump for joy uh, with each new discovery of an egg found and where uh, they least expected it to be. And you know, that sometimes happens to us. Uh, things happen to us that God has in store for us in places where we least expect it to be. But my grandkids and my kids, they search with expectation and anticipation knowing that the eggs are there and they're going to collect them, that somewhere around here there has to be an egg and they never give up hope that the golden egg will be theirs. I'll tell you what, I don't know how my kids, we, ne we didn't do this when I was a kid, but I don't know how my kids could have not found these eggs. <laughs> Go figure. I mean, these things were all over the yard and they were full of prizes and all that kind of stuff, but... Uh, I'll tell you, we just kind of coddle our kids a little bit today, don't we? A little bit. But here's the deal. Hope can be found if we but just keep our eyes open. 
Hope can be found if we just keep our eyes open. As a matter of fact, the scripture uh, tells us to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. We're told that in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Easter, though, is a reminder that God is in the business of awakening hope with this within us. He's in the business of awakening hope within us. He does this in many different ways that can be subtle. Uh, it can be missed if we're not careful. And maybe hope comes through a simple conversation with a friend. Maybe it, hope is sparked by a, a small answered prayer that we've prayed. Hope can be found in an unexpected text or maybe even a letter in the mail. It could come by noticing that beauty of a sunrise or the smile of a child. Hope can be found in taking time to be grateful for what we have, maybe for what we do, rather than being frustrated by what we do not have. You see, the key is our expectation level. Just like a child searching for eggs in the yard, we search the horizon for God's subtle signs of hope because we know that God is here. God is all over. He's omnipresent. He's also all-knowing. God is an omnipresent God. He's all around us. And that's what he desires for us. And that's why he sent his son to die on the cross for each and every one of us so that when we accept him, we can know that he walks with us, he talks with us. You know, Easter comes at just the right time. It comes at just the right time, and that's on your outline as well. It is Jesus' compassion for those he loves that, that caused him to sacrificially give up his life. It is his compassion that causes him to resurrect from the dead as well. As Jesus meets Mary in the doorway of the now empty tomb, Jesus' immediate concern are the tears that are streaming down Mary's face. Look back with me at our text in John chapter 20, if you would please, and let's go to uh, verse 15. Let's back up to 14 so we get it in the context. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. But hear this, woman, he said, why are you crying? Why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. She said, do not hold on to me, Jesus said, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord and she told them that he had said these things to her. You know, just as Mary has given up all hope, Jesus meets her in her tears. He meets her in her, in her, in her tears. Why are you crying? He asks. John, the author of this gospel account, tells us that Mary thinks Jesus is a gardener, <laughs> tending the grounds around the tombs. And John offers this information, I believe, on purpose. Why? And it's not just that Mary is confused and mistaken, although she is, but also because she is absolutely correct. Jesus is tending to the broken places of life. He is, in fact, repairing the brokenness that began in the Garden of Eden long ago in the book of Genesis. The Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created a garden, a garden of perfection for his creation to reside in. Please turn with me, if you would, please, all the way to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. Keep your place in John, though, if you would. Genesis chapter 3. I 
I love to hear those pages turning. Maybe somebody has that recorded on their iPhone or something. You're just fooling me, aren't you? Maybe not. Genesis uh, chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. God came searching. God came searching for his creation but could not find them because of their shame. They were hiding. They were hiding. They were naked and and so they hid. And you know, the story of Easter is about a God who re-enters a garden, your garden, the garden of those who are willing to accept his plan of salvation, hear his word, believe his word, and accept his word, repent, profess him as Lord, and be baptized unto him. It is God's desire to offer life to you once again. Now, back to the tomb. As soon as Jesus speaks Mary's name, she recognizes him and calls him teacher. In the middle of her darkest moment, Easter came just in time. With Easter often comes the long-awaited birth of spring. In, In some places around the country, the winters are harsh and they're bitter. We know that. Ours have been fairly mild in comparison Sure, it can be fun to have that, that first snow, maybe shovel the driveway a bit and build a little snowman. But after weeks and months of cold weather, it, it kind of grows old for most. I mean, some people love it, but you know, trees without leaves and ground covered in ice and snow cause people to count down the days until things begin to warm up and everything comes back to life. Even so, When that day finally comes, it is as if it's unexpected. We grow so accustomed to the world without life that we are shocked when we finally see the first signs of life bud out on the trees and the grass begin to turn green. But spring always comes just at the right time to bring life to a barren land. You know, Charles Murray Charlie was preparing for the Summer Olympics. He was a student at the University of Cincinnati, true story. Because Charlie had never been in Christianity, I mean, never gone to church. His parents weren't church-going people. Um, but But he met some friends that started talking to him about how much God cared for him and that God wanted to have a relationship with him. And he was honestly quite skeptical about all of that. As I say, you know, he, he just was skeptical about what they were telling him about Christianity and about the Lord. But he was interested. I mean, he was interested. So over the semester, he talked to his Christian friend about God's love and God's plan and God's rescue and how much he mattered to God. And one night he decided to call his Christian friend up and he said, tell me again those verses in the Bible that says God cares about me. And his friend shared those verses once again. After he hung up, he decided to go over to the school pool uh, to do some practice diving because he was preparing again, you know, for the Olympics. He had special privileges where he could go in just any time he wanted to go in, even if the pool was closed. At the University of Cincinnati, it is an enclosed pool and of course the lights were off because it was closed, but it was, had a high glass ceiling and the moon was full this particular night and was shining through that glass. And he looked at it for the first time, uh, this, the moon and how beautiful it was. So he started loosening up his body, getting ready to, to dive. And he ha- actually had, turned around and, and he looked back at, at the wall. And the pool was behind him And he was just stretching. And as he stretched, he saw a cross. His arms made a cross on the wall. 
He was 20 feet in the air, if you will, on a diving platform. And um, let me just tell you right off bat so you don't anticipate the wrong thing. Nothing bad is going to happen, okay? <laughs> this is a good story. This is Easter. It's not like a <laughs> kind of thing, okay? But he did. He started thinking about what his friend had told him. Uh, and, and so he was getting ready to do that dive. And the moonlight was coming in and shining. It made the cross. It looked like that for the first time Charlie felt God's love in his heart. He realized that Christ had died for him. And that is how much God loved him. And in the moment on the 20 plus feet diving platform, he sat down and he opened his life to Christ. He opened his life to Christ. He said, Jesus Christ came into my life and made a difference. And he decided right then and there, 20 feet up from ground floor to become a follower of Jesus Christ. He was sitting there in the dark when about five minutes later a janitor walked in and suddenly flipped on the light. It startled Charlie. He got up and as he looked down he saw that the pool had been emptied. It was in repair. God let Charlie know right then and there you matter to me. You matter to me. This story needs to incorporate the hope that comes from the seasons in our lives as well. We go through some tough seasons in this life, but one thing we can know is that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord, he is walking right there with us every step of the way. It is like Martin Luther once said, our Lord has written the promise of the resurrection, not in books alone, but in every leaf in the springtime. Now, I'm not speaking of pantheism here, okay? God literally being in everything, but God created the leaves. He created every flower. He created the blossoms. The seasons of life remind us that God brings life from death, and he can bring life to our most hopeless of all places. Back to our text. At this point, you can kind of feel the shift in tone in this story as Mary recognizes that Jesus is alive. Her hope is resurrected. She comes back to life. The dream of the restoration and healing is once again a possibility. And I wonder what would happen if today we were able to see Jesus all around us, physically, maybe even the places that you've been missing him, because we can see him in all those places that I mentioned earlier, through other people, through God's creation, we can see Jesus. And Easter is when we look at him face to face and we hear him call us by name and know that we can hope again. Why? Because Jesus is alive. The resurrection is victory over death. On your outline again, victory over death. You see, what Mary discovered early at the tomb was that the thing that she believed to be most final was not the end, but only the beginning. <laughs> Jesus rising from the dead meant that sin and its ultimate outcome, which is death, could not overcome our Savior, Jesus Christ. He held power and sway over it. Death did not have the last word nor the final say, but Jesus Christ did. The powerful revelation that comes with this, this truth is that if Jesus can overcome death, there is nothing in our lives that he cannot defeat and overcome. Nothing. Now, earlier in the book of John, Jesus made this audacious claim. So if you go back to John, but instead of going all the way back to 20, and if you are there, then come back the other way, take a left turn and go to John Chapter 11, if you would, please. John chapter 11. I'm going to look at just a couple of verses there. <clears throat> verses, beginning in verse 23, actually. This is where uh, you're familiar with, with this uh, account, I'm sure. Martha said to Jesus, verse 21 of, of John chapter 11... 
Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother, that was Lazarus, you know, would not have died. But know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But hear what Jesus said to her, because Jesus said to her, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And he asked her, do you believe this? Do you believe this? We are going to live for eternity with our Lord. Jesus said to his followers then, and he says to us now, he is the resurrection and the life, and he is the hope of life eternal and the key to true life.